name is Julia Attias. Uh, I'm 31 years old and a PhD student here at CHAPS, which stands for the Centre of Human and Aerospace Physiological Sciences at King's College London. When you uh, embark on a PhD, your job is to uh, research a scientific area of interest. Uh, my area is space physiology. So space physiology is the understanding of what happens to people's bodies when they go out of Earth's atmosphere into areas that don't have gravity. We are, uh, well, we have obviously evolved in a in a, a gravity field, so that everything that our body does, the way we move, the way we function, is all related to gravity. So if we take that away, then every single thing to do with how our body functions and operates changes. Um, and it's uh, attempting not only an under a thorough understanding of what happens, but actually how to help stop those things from happening. Um, because if we want to send people to Mars, which we do, uh, and is definitely on the horizon, then we need to make sure that the body can stay protected and can, st and can make sure that it maintains its function as it should do so that those people are able to get there and work and research and, and do everything that they need to do. So a, lot, a part, big part of my job is to try to understand ways in which we can help to prevent uh, deterioration of certain physical systems when venturing into those environments. I love a few things. A, being part of a huge team of people that will hopefully see humans get to Mars safely and back. Um, I absolutely love finding out information that doesn't currently exist. I think that's my biggest motivation for wanting a career in research because I realised that that was the means to do that. Um, I love being continually challenged. I think that that's what I realised uh, shortly after my degree, that I wanted something that would forever challenge me. I get bored very quickly, which isn't necessarily a good thing. And the only way to stop that is by doing something that will constantly pose challenges that just won't tire. And this is exactly what that does. There's always going to be questions that always need answers. Um, so I think that, yeah, they're, they're the main things that I love about what I do. Well, actually, as a youngster, I, I didn't actually have as much of a passion for science as I do now. So if you would have asked me when I was doing my GCSEs if I wanted a career in science, I actually probably would have said no. Um, at the time, I was part of a performing arts school and I loved dancing and singing and, and kind of being in front of a camera. Not that I ever was in front of a camera at that age, but that's what I liked the idea of the most. Um, so I actually wanted to be a TV presenter. Um, and I really don't know, looking back now, I don't know why, um, but that is what I would have told you if I was 16 in this chair right now. For my A-levels, I chose to continue with PE um, because I knew that it would get more theoretical and it was the theory stuff that excited me about PE because I knew that I'd get to learn more about the body and how it worked. Um, I also chose psychology because I, I was just interested in it. And, um, and geography, because I think I really enjoyed it at GCSE, so I, I wanted to carry it on. So then I chose uh, to do a sports science degree, but again, I still loved the, the, uh, the kind of media side of things, the, the performing arts. So at the time, I, cho I chose to do a, um, a split degree, half in sports science and half in media, um, and it was accepted. And then a month before I was supposed to start university, I got a phone call telling me that that combination doesn't exist and that they're really sorry, but they don't know how it managed to slip through the net and how they managed to accept it, but that that combination doesn't exist. So if I wanted to still go there, I would have to either choose media in its entirety or sports science in its entirety. And um, that was a bit of a... Uh, a bit of a bombshell considering I was supposed to start the next month and when you're 18 you don't really know how to deal with uh, those kind of situations very well. So in the end I opted just for the sports science route um, because I thought that it might end up leading me to, to better places and, um, and that's what I did and thankfully that's, that was the right choice. I really really loved learning about how the body worked um, and I thought if I can understand how the body works 
in its entirety and I know what makes it tick and I know what bothers it and I know what makes it function correctly, then surely I'll always know the things to do to keep it healthy. And that, that was my mindset at the time. I think the, the, the major thing is the fact that I took a five year gap between my undergraduate degree and my masters, which can be viewed in one of two ways. In one way, it can be a negative because you completely get out of the swing of how academia works and academic writing and all of those things that are required of you. Um, but on the flip side, I had five years worth of working experience and you know, learning life lessons, which actually can help you, certainly with things like discipline, um, knowing how to schedule your time and organisation for when I came to do my master's. So that wasn't necessarily a, 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 a difficulty, but it, that was definitely a challenge. Um, and then finding funding for my PhD was probably the biggest challenge that I've had to date. Um, so it took me two years to find funding. Unfortunately, when you say to people that you want to, uh, you want money to research what happens to astronauts in space, they uh, tend to give you a little bit of a funny and bewildered look as if to say, what the hell are you talking about? Get out. Because if we think about it, it's only really a handful of people. Um, and that's one of the biggest issues about trying to research science in space is the lack of money. But thankfully, there's a lot of applicability to different populations on Earth that what you find about that the astronaut population can apply to. Um, so it took me a couple of years to get the right proposal together and to read and read and read and figure out how my findings can apply and to whom. And um, eventually I was fortunate enough to, to get some funding from King's to be able to pursue my PhD. But that two years was, was, was difficult um, because if I hadn't have got the funding when I did, I actually probably wouldn't be here today, uh, as in be doing this. Um, because there was only so much time that I was going to be able to wait and bide my time to find funding to be able to do this. So thankfully, thankfully it came. Um, so I think probably the only other experience I can draw upon is just being being younger. You get you know peer pressure and people saying, "Oh, why do you want to do that?" Or, "Or come on, come and um, come and have a smoke with us." You know, just just all the all the kind of things that would normally lead you astray. I think that it can be really difficult as a youngster, I think, to, to, to stay headstrong and to keep, to keep those thoughts you know, at the forefront of your mind. No, I, I, you know, I, I want to do this and I want to do that and I have goals. And, and I think that it, that it was probably a little bit of a challenge because I would sometimes feel a little bit abnormal for wanting, you know, for, for wanting things so badly. And I would often get called quite highly strong. Um, I wasn't the most laid back of kids, um, probably because I knew that there were certain things that I wanted and I knew that there was, there was certain groundwork that I had to put in place in order to, to, to have a career and to have a future. If I'm running a study then I will be primarily in the lab uh, all day every day for a few weeks testing testing people testing different things um, if I'm not running a study then I will probably be analyzing all of the data that came from the study so spending a lot of time at the laptop number crunching Excel spreadsheets making graphs running statistics um, but also the work I do is an international collaboration so I spend a lot of time on my emails um, and at, at unfriendly hours um, because everyone's working on different clocks. Um, I also read a lot of journal articles and do lots of highlighting uh, because that's where I get my knowledge and information as to what to expect or how to explain my findings. Um, and I do some teaching, so I help with undergraduate um, student physiology practicals. Um, what else do I do? Have meetings with my supervisors, uh, who are also scattered around different parts of the world, so even trying to get a meeting takes time. Um, and planning of studies as well, it is quite a big part of my job, so I have to put together ethics applications and plan what I'm going to do and justify why I'm going to do it and make sure that everything can be scientifically backed. So no two days are the same, um, they have their staple duties, but things will change based on the time of year and, and, and which stage I'm at.
and obviously I do a lot of writing. I write up everything that I do. This is what my research actually uh, revolves around. So this is a skin suit, uh, it's called the skin suit, and um, it was created at MIT in America, and it's now a project that's actually run by the European Space Agency. So when I said that I um, work with multiple collaborators, so the European Space Agency is the primary one, um, but also some colleagues over at MIT as well. So if you remember earlier on, I told you that um, one of the major issues with astronauts going into space is that they, they're not faced with gravity anymore. Now we can use another word for gravity called loading. It's basically the fact that when we move around every day, we have something underneath our feet that we can push against. Now, we don't have that in space. So this suit has been created to try to replicate that loading. So the theory is, if astronauts wear this every day for multiple hours a day, that they can actually have something to push against and work against to hopefully help maintain their uh, muscles, their bones, uh, and also their spine, which is one of the major issues in space. So you actually grow, again, because you don't have any gravity pushing you down. Now that s spinal growth can be really painful. If that can be prevented by something like this, A, astronauts would, would be very happy, and B, we shouldn't see that prevalence in, in back pain. It has been flown in space once last September, and it actually flies again in 19 days on uh, French astronaut Thomas Pesquet um, and he'll be uh, incorporating it into his six month mission on the International Space Station. One of my biggest passions is to try to encourage um, youngsters, mainly girls because I am one, but youngsters in general to, to pursue a career in science one day. So I like to do a lot of outreach and it's more often than not on a voluntary basis. So I've been into schools quite a few times um, to talk to kids about what I do. Um, and actually when Tim Peake flew into space, I did quite a few activities that revolved around that. So I, um, I was at the Science Museum on the day that he launched, talking to the public about you know, his mission and why it's important that we, we look after his health. Um, and I got invited to a school in Kent, again, to talk similarly about the kind of issues that he'll be experiencing and about what I do. Um, I also write blogs for a charity called Glamsci. Uh, Glamsci is run by a girl called Amy King, and um, she is a disabled young woman. And she was always told through her school life that she would never be able to do science because of her disabilities. And she, uh, she kind of came up against all the odds and is, did a, an undergraduate degree in chemistry, and now she's doing her masters. Um, and I, I, I respect that so much and have a lot of admiration for people like that and want to kind of plug that into youngsters. So I, I do some work with her. Doing my masters was definitely a highlight, um, which sounds really backhanded because doing a masters in anybody's mind is no mean feat. Um, but uh, it was just a complete and utter eye opener. I had no idea that there was such a thing as looking at how astronauts' bodies change in space and that that, that was something that needed to be done um, and I think just that whole year really really fascinated and enlightened me um, so much so that it made me want to continue with it and, and do it for my career. Um, I'd probably say the highlight of my life to date was going on a parabolic flight which is one of those aeroplanes where you get to experience uh, zero gravity. Um, that for me was just on another level um, you know, a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the world's population get to do that. And I'm one of those people that have done that. And weirdly, I had a dream about it last night. Um, and, you know, it, it's just something that's been so paramount in my life. And I learned a hell of a lot about actually myself as a person to be able to go through something like that in Bordeaux. So I wasn't near any of my friends or family. I had some colleagues with me, which, you know, is, is nice. But at when you're doing something so extreme like that you need the you know you need support around you and I didn't have that and and that it was actually quite a quite a life changing moment for me um but that's definitely been my highlight today without a doubt and look I mean I've spent 5 years now in the space science field and I of course don't want to leave it um, unfortunately in the UK opportunities 
um, to have a job in space science are of course quite slim. Uh, we haven't really got on board with the whole space physiology thing, um, well really ever to be honest and it's only now that Tim Peake has flown to space that the UK are finally starting to realise that we need more of a national space programme so perhaps there'll be something somewhere that I can do in the UK. Um, otherwise of course there's organisations like ESA, European Space Agency that um, I would love to work for one day. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just have to see, but I, I've, I've, I've come this far, so I don't want to leave it, and uh, hopefully I won't have to. Um, so I'll just have to continue working hard and see what happens, I think. Yeah, I think there's normally a few things that I say when I'm faced in front of kids. I think one of the main things, it's gonna sound really simple, but be curious. Um, I always used to describe myself to people that I was never happy with knowing that something happened. I always wanted to know why it happened. And because I wanted to know why it happened, that naturally led me to be inquisitive, uh, to be creative, and to make me determined, because I wouldn't settle for not knowing why. I, I would want to know why. So that old kind of uh, joke that people say about kids saying, but why, 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 which yes, is annoying as hell, but actually that's probably coming from a really, really good and healthy place. So ask why, want to know why, be curious about things. Make sure that you pick at least one of the STEM, so science, technology, engineering, math subjects at school. It doesn't even matter if you don't know exactly what you want to do, but if you pick any of them, there will always be some gate um, or some overlap into what you might choose you want to do in the future. Um, so very generic piece of advice, but pick at least one of those staple subjects and then you'll have a much better chance of getting into whatever it is you want to do in the future. To, to be resilient, you know, if you know that you want something, don't let other people tell you that you can't do it. Because unfortunately in this world, a lot of people gain their happiness from making other people feel unhappy and kind of, dampening other people's dreams because they don't want to see them thrive. So stay true to yourself, have the belief that you want and, and faith that you will do something and make sure that you take the steps to see that through. Because if you want it to happen, then it can. It's only going to be people around you that are going to deter you. So stay headstrong and um, persevere. Where are you? Yeah. No way. Yeah, I was sick. And you can put that on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was sick. Well, you get 30, 30 parabolas. So a parabola is like an arc, right? And uh, each parabola you get about 23 seconds of weightlessness. There were 30 in total. And we'd scheduled um, for 28 of them to work. So we had an agenda for every single one, up to 28. And then 29 and 30, we could have fun and float and just be free. Um, and I made it all the way through to 28 without being sick. And then 29 and 30, I was sick. The ones where I, I was allowed to have fun. So I sat down and ate a Kit Kat instead. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs>